It's been called the Christmas Miracle. Out amid the hard frosts of World War I's Western Front, a unique, precious thing happened in December of 1914, an event that's gone down as one of the most noble moments in the history of war. After nearly five months of fighting, in which over half a million had died, German, British, and a handful of French troops spontaneously hit the pause button. Starting on December the 24th, carols began to replace bullets. Artillery shells gave way to season's greetings. Finally, on Christmas Day, it happened. From the putrid, miserable trenches, men emerged, not ready to fight, but to make peace. As the guns fell silent, former enemies met in the mud and squalor of no man's land to exchange gifts and drink. The carnage briefly put on holes by the season of goodwill. Although the fighting soon resumed, the Christmas truce is today legendary, a faint oasis of light in one of Europe's blackest periods. But what really happened that day, and what, if any, long-term effects did it have? In this seasonal episode, Warrior Graphics is taking a break from our usual diet of non-stop battles to explore perhaps the most famous truce of all. As Christmas 1914 approached in Europe, it wasn't toward a continent in the mood for peace on Earth and goodwill towards all mankind, but a continent devastated by war. Just six months earlier, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo had triggered what's often compared to a series of dominoes toppling, but in reality was more like a set of highly unstable sticks of dynamite crashing into one another until the whole of Europe simply exploded. In less than five months of hostilities, half a million people have been killed on the Western Front alone, victims of a new, mechanized warfare that could annihilate thousands in the blink of an eye. Alongside those dead lay another million and a half wounded. Swaths of France were in ruins, Belgium was on the brink of starvation, and running in an unbroken 450-mile line from sea to the Swiss border lay the front. A muddy hell of shell craters and barbed wire separating the two sides, known as no man's land. In short, it was a setup about as conductive to feelings of festive cheer as seeing a flaming Christmas pudding accidentally dropped onto a beloved pet. Yet it was amid this nightmare that one of the greatest seasonal miracles would soon occur. And the things that made the Christmas truce possible were more often than not the same things that otherwise made the war so damn miserable. To really understand the hows and whys of what transpired that December, we first need to get our heads around what life was like for people at the front. As the fantastically year of 1914 drew to a close, soldiers on both sides were already ensconced in the trenches. But this wasn't the trench warfare of later years, with deep reinforced lines and semi-private areas. Oh no. This was trench life at its most miserably primitive. Often a mere three feet deep by three feet wide, the trenches snaking through Western Europe barely afforded shelter. Instead, they collected the endless rain, creating a series of mud baths that young, unhappy men were forced to cower in, exposed the biting cold. It was a world in which cigarettes were too damp to light, in which sleep was near impossible, in which being dry was a distant dream. Crucially, though, it was also a world in which the enemy was a constant presence. The distance between Allied trenches and those of the Germans could be anywhere from 300 yards to as little as 50. That meant the men stuck in this muddy hell weren't fighting a distant, invisible enemy, but an enemy who was always there, one they could hear talking or coughing or cursing the damn cold like they were. Nor were the soldiers really even enemies at this stage. Most of the things we associate with World War I, the poison gas, the endless shelling, the utter carnage of battles like the Somme were still in the future. Awful treats the gods of war had stored up to dole out at a later date. That meant those on the front could still just about see their opponents as human. Humans, like them, forced to fight a depressing war. Humans who, like them, would rather be home for Christmas. While the idea of young men signing up thinking the war would be over by Christmas is a bit of a cliché, it's true that no one expected it to last this long. The Kaiser even famously promised his men, you will be home before the leaves have fallen from the trees. Now, here they were, the leaves long fallen from the trees, and with the holidays fast approaching, not sat in their warm homes, but drenched and freezing in some muddy field, fighting a war with no end in sight. And while that war would indeed continue for another four bitter grinding years, it wouldn't be entirely without a break. But rather than coming from politicians or generals, that pause would be entirely down to the men themselves.
Although the chances of an official ceasefire that Christmas were somewhere up there with the chances of me getting all the German pronunciation correct in this video, that didn't mean people on the international stage weren't trying. The new Pope Benedict XV had asked all leaders if the guns may fall silent at least upon the night the angels sang. In England, prominent suffragettes had published a letter calling on the women of Germany to demand peace for Christmas. So the idea of a short truce was in the air, and it's not like there wasn't some precedent. Sporadically across the months of war, German and British units had brokered short ceasefires to retrieve bodies left in no man's land. That December the 11th, the Essex Regiment's 2nd Battalion had even met with German troops for a peaceful chat. Still, the Christmas truce would be orders of magnitude greater, and in some ways, it was all thanks to the Kaiser. As the holidays approached, Wilhelm II had ordered Christmas trees to be dispatched to the front for his men to enjoy. His plan seems to have been that the sight of good old-fashioned German Tannenbaum would set a fire in the troops' bellies, convincing them to fight like festive lions. Instead, the men were all like, God to Himmel, the Kaiser has sent us in lovely Christmas tree! Fetch the bratwurst! We must have this funky party, yes? Starting around December the 23rd, German units up and down the line began lighting their trees and they sang carols. Around the same time, the weather also began to get into the festive spirit. After weeks of rain, a cold snap suddenly settled over Western Europe. The muddy ground began to solidify with frost. A light dusting of snow fell over no man's land. It was, as one British soldier recorded in a letter home, real Christmas weather. Cold yet somehow also magical. It was a shift that didn't go unnoticed on either side of the lines. Across the 23rd and 24th, more and more German units began singing carols like Stil Nacht or Silent Night. This is where the proximity of the trenches becomes important. Because they were only a few dozen yards apart, the British could hear the Germans singing not just as a distant hubbub, but as real, recognizable songs. Songs which reminded them of home. As will so often be the case in this episode, reactions differed up and down the line depending on who was in charge and what mood the men were in. But in enough places, British soldiers were curious enough to respond. Private Marmaduke Walkington later recalled that he and others in the trench started shouting at the Germans first insults, then jokey insults, and then finally just jokes. Nor was it only the Tommies. Grenadier guard Colin Wilson would later note that the Germans began calling to them across no man's land. These Germans shouted out, what about you singing Holy Night? Well, we had a go, but of course, we weren't very good. Maybe it was the time of year. Maybe it was the snowfall or just the warm lights cast by the German Christmas trees flickering across the dark fields of Flanders. But for whatever reason, communication seems to have opened across the barbed wire that night. Eventually, according to Private Walkington, a German said, Tomorrow, you no shoot, we no shoot. As midnight approached that Christmas Eve, some junior officers started quietly telling their men to follow a policy of live and let live, only firing if the Germans fired first. This was done on the sly, without permission from above, and it helped set the groundwork for what would come next. Yet even this can't explain everything that happened when dawn broke. In plenty of sectors on the front, no shouted agreements were made. No quiet orders were given. For some soldiers, the events that would soon transpire would surprise them as much as they surprised the rest of the world. Before we really get into the Christmas truce, we need to be clear that it didn't take place everywhere. All along the front, there were units who, on Christmas Day 1914, did nothing but shoot at one another as mechanically as they had now for months on end. In fact, different tellings give wildly different estimates of how much of the line got involved, with Smithsonian Magazine, for example, saying most of the 450-mile front took part in the truce, while Britannia claims it was limited to about two-thirds of a mere 30-mile stretch. Regardless of which is more accurate, we can identify some characteristics that made the truce more likely in any given area. The first is Germans facing British troops. While records exist of some French units taking part, the general consensus is that they were less likely to see their opponents as fellow humans thanks to swaths of France already being under German occupation. The second is places where those German troops mostly identified as Saxon. Remember, at this stage, Germany has only been united some 40-odd years. Brits and Germans alike still saw Saxons and Prussians as basically different peoples. And while laying down arms to greet a Prussian might have made a British soldier think twice, doing the same for a genial Saxon carried far less political baggage. Of course, all of this wasn't absolute. There were places where Brits and Saxons failed to make peace, just as there were places where Prussians and French were able to shake hands. But as a general rule, it held remarkably well. Not that there was anything remotely general about what happened that day. As Christmas 1914 dawned, long stretches of the line were blanketed with a 
strange quiet. I remember the silence, 18-year-old Alfred Anderson recalls. The eerie sound of silence. All I'd heard for two months in the trenches was the hissing, cracking, and whining of bullets in flight. There was a dead silence that morning right across the land. For others, the first signs that this was going to be an unusual day came from the enemy camp. About 10 o'clock this morning, Alfred Dugan Shatter wrote to his mother, I was peeping over the parapet when I saw a German waving his arms, and presently two of them got out of their trench and came towards ours. Shatter's first reaction was to shoot, but when he noticed the Germans were unarmed, one of our men went to meet them, and in about two minutes the ground between the two lines of trenches was swarming with men and officers of both sides, shaking hands and wishing each other a happy Christmas. Up and down the front, similar scenes were repeating. Silence followed by cautious greetings, people climbing out of trenches unarmed, risking their lives to meet their opponents, risking their lives to wish them a Merry Christmas. In each place the truce occurred, the specifics were different, even if the spirit was the same. For one Norfolk Infantry Brigade, it was the sight of a German officer approaching unarmed that sparked things. For others, it was the sound of distant caroling or a shouted invitation to meet in no man's land. Yet, however it started, before long it was clear that a fully-fledged miracle was occurring. Along the lines, guns fell quiet for the first time in nearly five months. Men had been trained to see one another as monsters, as savages, stepped gingerly out onto the frost-hardened ground to meet for the first time. Some came bearing gifts of food, tobacco. Others simply brought an open mind, fascinated to see what those on the other side looked like. By mid-afternoon, word was spreading along the lines and back to headquarters. There was no longer any denying it. Whether those in charge wanted it or not, a truce was now in full swing. And what happened next, that long ago day, was destined to go down in history. One of the luckiest things to happen that day was the discovery that many of the Germans could speak decent English, having worked in London before the war. Lucky because, as is so often the case with Brits, knowledge of literally any other language on the other side was effectively non-existent. But with enough Germans able to communicate, a confusing babble was avoided. Instead, the men who met found themselves having the cultural exchange of a lifetime. Now, reports of what exactly went on vary wildly. So rather than trying to paint a cohesive picture of a cohesive truce, we're instead going to give you a little snippet so that you can get some flavor of what went on that day. For some, the war's unexpected break was cause for a kind of giddy excitement as impromptu Christmas parties formed in no man's land. The 15th Infantry Brigade recorded in its official diary that somewhere between 200 and 400 men spontaneously left their trenches to sing carols together, their voices a source of warmth on that cold and frosty morning. Others, like the London Rifle Brigade, seemed to have focused on giving gifts. In a letter home, Private Henry Williamson delightedly wrote, In my mouth is a pipe presented by the Princess Mary. In the pipe is German tobacco. Ha ha, you say, from a prisoner or found in a captured trench. Oh dear no, from a German soldier. Marvelous, isn't it? In many places, rations were exchanged, photos were taken, pictures the two sides agreed to show one another during some future truce. But the swap didn't just stop with physical items. There are records of at least one British barber going across the lines to cut someone's hair, of others sneaking one another a dram of whiskey. One letter even records a drunk Scot supposedly falling asleep in the wrong trench and not waking up until the next day. Christmas cheer and general merriment, then, seem to have been in high supply but not everywhere. While the fraternizing and seasonal goodwill are what have stuck in the popular memory, for many soldiers the truce was a somber affair, a chance for both sides to retrieve their dead, holding joint burials in the wilderness of no man's land. Still, despite this multitude of experiences ranging from funerals and prayers to something like a party, one aspect of the truce has stood out in popular culture above all others. We're talking, of course, about the football. If you're an American, you may not be aware of this, but for English guys like me, the story of the Christmas truce is inextricably entwined with football, or what you in your delightfully absurd way might call soccer. Pretty much every popular retelling focuses on the festive match played between the Brits and the Germans. There are statues to it. It even crops up in Christmas adverts. So it can be surprising to learn its historicity is the subject of intense scholarly debate. It's time for us to dig into the perhaps World War I's strangest controversy. Despite its outsized role in the popular imagination, modern scholarly opinion on the football match that supposedly took place pretty much boils down to two basic views. One, eh, 
yeah, there's not much evidence that, you know, it probably didn't happen. And two, yeah, there's not much evidence, but there's probably just enough to say that it probably did happen. No one's denying that some form of game involving kicking shit around took place that day, with plenty of letters and eyewitness accounts saying a few guys here and there took turns kicking a billy can for fun. But the question is whether anything like an actual organized match took place. It's on this point that historians have some super intense disagreements. The pessimists point out that not a single account of a match has been corroborated by documents from both the British and German sides, and that references in letters often boil down to, my mate told me about his mate, he told me about him and his mate, he played footy with the Jerrys. But not so fast. The optimists counter. There might be no matches corroborated by both sides, but at least a couple of examples exist where two independent letters from one side both agreed a match was played. Since this argument has been dragging on for over a century now, we're not going to stake a claim to knowing the truth. But what we will say is this. If a match was played that day, there are two groups of participants more likely than others to have been involved. One is the 1st Battalion of the Norfolk Regiment, who recorded playing a game against the 16th Bavarian Reserve Infantry. Another major possibility is a game that supposedly took place between the 133rd Royal Saxon Regiment and some Scottish soldiers. Assuming either happened though they would have been wholly unlike the match of popular myth. One constant with the football tale is that the Germans supposedly won by 3-2 in many tellings because a British referee charitably ignored a German player being offside, something the German admitted the moment the whistle blew. And no, I'm not going to explain to our American viewers what offside means. If you really want to know, you could watch Ted Lasso. There's probably a whole episode about it. Hey look, this car's got an invisible steering wheel! <laughs> anyway, one reason these details are suspicious is because they seem to have been lifted from a later story by Robert Graves that dramatized the incident. Another is that one of the few corroborated accounts of the match by German Lieutenant Johannes Niemann paints a far less organized picture. In Niemann's version, there was no referee, no final whistle, just a bunch of men enjoying a kickabout that ended abruptly when an officer went full Grinch and told them to stop. Given the difficulty of playing amid the bomb craters and barbed wire of no man's land, it's this version of events that seems most likely. The sort of basic football game that kids today might play in a back alley on a winter's day. Still, the lack of evidence thus far discovered didn't mean no match happened. Some even believe that up to four games may have been independently played along the lines. And it came close to being more. A soldier in the Queen's Westminsters wrote home that his regiment offered the Germans a game that day, only to be politely rebuffed. Football or no football, though, there's no denying that the truce was magical. By some estimates, maybe a hundred thousand took part, hitting the pause button on the war simply to celebrate a common holiday. As the day drew to a close, several men even exchanged addresses, promising to meet one another in Britain or Germany after the war was over. But of course, not everyone was having such a wonderful experience. For hundreds of thousands more, the Christmas truce was nothing but a disappointing mirage. While the Christmas truce gets all the press, the reality is that for most soldiers, December 25, 1914 was a day like any other. The entire Eastern Front continued its mindless slaughter, in part thanks to Russian Orthodox Christmas being observed on a different day. Even back on the Western Front, many units simply didn't get a chance to make peace or didn't want to get involved. The men of the 1st Hertfordshire Regiment, for example, were ordered to open fire when the first Germans shouted Christmas greetings effectively killing all hopes for a truce. Worse still, Captain Billy Congreve recorded letting unarmed Germans approach that Christmas, only to mow them down the moment they got too close. We opened rapid fire on them, he grimly noted in his diary, which is the only truce they deserve. Others simply had the misfortune of being stationed in a sector where neither side felt inclined to make peace. The diary of the 2nd Battalion Grenadier Guards records nothing but an ordinary, miserable day, one in which the trenches were waterlogged, mortars dropped, and three men were killed by sniper fire. Even in areas where the truce was observed, not everyone was on board with it. Lieutenant C. M. Richards, whose first initial presumably stood for Cranky, openly wished for the return of good old sniping, while over on the German side, a miserable dick by the name of Adolf Hitler is said to have admonished his comrades, such a thing should not happen in wartime, have you no German sense of honor? The saddest part? Lots of people apparently agreed. Although we might expect Hitler to be a dick given that he's literally Hitler, the reaction of the officer corps was equally depressing. As early as the evening of December the 24th, some British regiments were receiving stern orders not to take part in any proposed truces. 
Others were even more direct. Veteran George Ashurst later said how a truce had started in his sector, only for some general to order artillery fired to drive everyone off no man's land. As with everything about the truce, though, reactions were far from uniform. While some officers got their men back in the trenches with shouted threats, in other places the truce was simply left to fizzle out on its own. In these instances, no one taking part was under the impression that the pause in fighting might be permanent. As night fell, the two sides went their separate ways. One German artilleryman told his New English friend, Today we have peace. Tomorrow you fight for your country. I fight for mine. Good luck. Yet reports exist of the truce in many places, lasting until midnight, and in some places even longer. Second Lieutenant Alfred Dugan Chatter, who we met briefly earlier, wrote again to his mother on the 26th of December, telling her that neither side had started firing again. Meanwhile, the Cheshire Regiment recorded playing a football match on New Year's Day. Where fighting did resume, it could often happen in a gentlemanly way. German officer Hauptmann von Sinner and his British counterpart both bowed and wished one another a Merry Christmas before returning to the war. A touch of chivalry that would soon feel impossibly alien as the fighting grew increasingly bitter. By the new year, the last holdouts had picked up their guns and returned to fighting. On the super rare occasions where the truce held beyond the dawn of 1915, military headquarters seems to have transferred the unit in question away, replacing them with others more willing to kill and die for king and country. To the officer class's credit, though, there would be no court-martials, no summary executions for those who fraternized with the enemy, or any punishments of any sort. While the hard reality is that the generals likely feared the effect on morale, it does give this moment in World War I history a little extra magic, almost as if the officers were acknowledging how unique it was. And the sad fact is, it really was unique. As Christmas 1915 approached, a flurry of orders were issued to stop a repeat of the truce, to make sure the war continued, even if Jesus himself decided to pop down to earth for some football. But then, though, it's not clear the men would have wanted a do-over. In the year since the Christmas miracle, World War I had gone from a nightmare slaughterhouse to the sort of place even slaughterhouses have nightmares about. That year had seen the first deployment of poison gas, the carnage of the Gallipoli campaign, the first German zeppelins bombing British cities. Perhaps more to the point, it had likely seen the death of most of those who took part in the 1914 truce. 1915 had been a year of carnage. On a purely statistical level, it's probable that many, if not most, of those who bravely walked into no man's lands the year before already dead or injured. And so, the one-year anniversary passed without anyone singing carols across the lines or going out to meet their opponents. For the rest of the Great War, across Christmases 1916 and 1917, right up to November 1918, there would never again be another general pause in the fighting. Today, over a hundred years later, it's fashionable to note that the truce of 1914, for all its humanity, had little to no impact on history. Certainly the war itself grounds on for four more years, killing millions upon millions. By the time it ended, Germans, British and French alike, were all too exhausted, all too angry to want to commemorate a moment of shared humanity. Despite being widely reported at the time, the Christmas truce vanished from most history is only being rediscovered in the 1960s. Yet to only focus on such dry facts is to miss the point of the tale entirely, as this channel will hopefully show across its lifetime. War is not often glorious. Interesting, yes, inspiring, certainly, but also messy, bloody, and far too filled with suffering to usually be called glorious. Yet for a few days around Christmas 1914, glorious is what it really was. In the midst of one of Europe's darkest hours, hundreds, if not thousands, of ordinary men were able to put aside their differences, to put down their guns, and meet one another as equals. To celebrate Christmas not as enemies, but as fellow human beings. Maybe it's the sentiment of the season, but it really does feel like there's something beautiful in that. Something perhaps greater than the sum of its parts. Something we might perhaps call hope. The men who took part in the Christmas trees may all be long dead, but in this one, timeless, fascinating story, their spirits will forever live on. Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays.